Richard Pena was the program director of the Film Society of Lincoln Center and the director of the New York Film Festival from 1988 to 2012. Beginning in 1992, he organized with the Spanish Ministry of Culture the annual Spanish Cinema Now series at Lincoln Center, as well as the Rendezvous with French Cinema with Unifrance since 1996. He is a professor of film studies at Columbia University, where he specializes in film theory and international cinema. Please join me in welcoming Richard Peña. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this program for asking me to speak. The problem or the question of industry haunts much of the history of Latin American cinema. And to begin with, we might think about the history of the concept as it developed. Cinema came early to Latin America. By 1896, less than one year after the Lumiere brothers unveiled their new invention, the Cinematograph in Paris, there were already uh, projected moving image exhibitions in Montevideo, Rio, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and Mexico City. The first purveyors of cinema were foreigners, either traveling show people or in some cases, new immigrants to Latin America from Europe. Yet by 1910, what filmmaking existed was firmly in the hands of local producers. Filmmaking in those earliest years tended to be highly decentralized. The economics were such that if you could get a hold of a camera or build one yourself, that didn't happen unfrequently in Latin America, you could enter the industry. There were no obstacles or other hurdles. The countries which truly led the path towards what might be called the mass production and globalization of cinema were France and Italy. From practically the very first years of cinema, far-sighted entrepreneurs in both countries learned to rationalize methods of production so that films could be mass produced on an extraordinary scale. As film equipment had largely been standardized by the turn of the century, and cinema at this time was still without synchronized dialogue, exporting the bulk of this mass production seemed like a natural consequence. So by 1914, the year of the outbreak of World War I, probably about 90% of all films screened in Latin America were either French or Italian. Argentina was, in fact, Italy's biggest overseas market. In Latin America, only Brazil had managed by this point to create a significant level of film production. Mexico, of course, was by 1914 wrapped up in the tumult of its revolution, perhaps the world's first great filmed event, while Argentine production, with a few exceptions, was still small and sporadic, perhaps because the Italian cinema dominated the market so thoroughly. 1914 was a significant year in another way. It was also the year in which an American company, Paramount, opened its first office in Latin America, in Rio de Janeiro. The U.S. industry had been an extremely decentralized industry up until about 1911. After that, the pressure of the Edison-run Patents Trust forced many smaller producers out of business, so that by 1914, the industry was beginning to be dominated by a few very large, very well-capitalized companies. For the first time, these companies began aggressively to export their films abroad. The moment could not have been more opportune. World War I led to a mass mobilization in Europe, crippling film industries across the continent. Moreover, certain materials needed for, war, for film production were needed for the war effort, so production levels were greatly diminished, meaning that the French and the Italians could no longer fill the needs of their overseas clients. Into this breach raced the Americans, who not only took, quickly took over the overseas markets developed by the French and the Italians, but by the end of the war, the domestic markets in most of Europe as well, including those in France and Italy. By 1920, the U.S. was the undisputed king of world cinema, commanding at least 75% of the world film market, and in many places, even more. Among the even mores was, of course, Latin America, where the U.S. literally dominated practically the entire film markets of most countries. This domination dissuaded local entrepreneurs from investing in local production, so that most years of the 1920s, production of the major nations was reduced to single digits. Things began to change with the arrival of synchronized sound in the cinema, 
I always make the distinction because there was never anything really called silent cinema. I mean, no one ever sat in the dark and silence watching movies. Uh, there was always musical accompaniment, and narrators, and even sound effects added to films. The first synchronized sound films were being made in Hollywood in 1926, and by 1929, sound, sound technology had arrived to Latin America. Although the initial fascination with the new technology, uh, with the new technological development, led to a temporary spike in audiences, it was soon clear to Hollywood that foreign audiences were starting to stay away, as few understood English. Thus, an opportunity was created for those who could create a Spanish language cinema for that potentially enormous market. A race was on between Mexico, Argentina, and Spain that Mexico would eventually win. Mexico was, in fact, the only country to have created a successful national film industry in Latin America. Argentina's attempts were always woefully undercapitalized, and Brazil's two attempts, Atlantida and Rio and Veracruz and Sao Paulo, remained more regional phenomena than anything else. Mexico cinema was aided immeasurably by the support given it by the government of Lázaro Cárdenas, who held the presidency from 1934 until 1940, and who fully supported the cinema as industrial development, import substitution, and cultural education. The Mexican government co-financed the building of film studios, provided low-cost loans to producers, and smoothed the way for film exports around the world. By 1945, Mexico was making more films than the rest of Latin America put together. The next great event in terms of the concept of the Latin American film industry occurred in 1959 with the founding of ICAIC, the Cuban Film Institute, as a result of the victory of Fidel Castro's forces. ICAIC essentially nationalized cinema in Cuba. That is, cinema became a completely government-controlled activity. Production, distribution, exhibition, import and export all came under the aegis of ICAIC. This endpoint nationalization of cinema model, adapted from the Soviets in Eastern Europe, appeared at first highly attractive to Latin Americans. Even at its height, when Mexico was producing 130 films a year, it never controlled more than 25% of its own domestic market. The rest was practically completely dominated by Hollywood. For nations suffering under the twin strains of a lack of private investment and overwhelming foreign competition, nationalization, or some variation on it, seemed very attractive. Thus, the new phase of, Latin American film industry, of the Latin American film industry dance became that of government film agencies. While the Mexican government had been supportive of its cinema, the industry had remained firmly in private hands, but by the 1960s, there were increasing calls for its own Cuban-style nationalization, especially as it progressively declined. Embra Filmi, Inca, in, Inca Imcine, Foncine, Chile Films, Focine, are just a few of the national film agencies that emerged from the 1960s to the 1980s, each with a mandate to organize the cinema within its given country and to promote domestic film production. This phase then hit its own proverbial wall in the late 1980s, when the mounting Latin American economic crisis made state-supported film institutes ready targets for fiscal reformers. In Brazil, Fernando Collor, the first democratically elected president of Brazil since 1964, made it a campaign promise to eliminate Embra Filme, the state film institute, which he did immediately after being elected. The government of Carlos Saul Menem in Argentina, having received little support from the arts, viciously attacked the budget for culture in the name of a new austerity. The reliance on government institu institutions had proved a double-edged sword. It had provided support, but also had created a dependency. Production levels in the early 90s slipped to their lowest levels in Latin America since the 1920s, and the sociologist Nestor Garcia Canclini published in Mexico an article with, an article with the ominous title, Will There Be a Latin American Cinema in the Year 2000? Happily, the answer to that question is yes, and indeed a thriving one. But perhaps because the question of creating a Latin American film industry or industries no longer makes much sense. <laughs>
the decline or even disappearance of state support for filmmaking across Latin America coincided with the emergence of new forms of digital film production and eventually distribution and exhibition. As digital equipment began to proliferate across the region, it freed filmmakers from the older structures that had so often hindered their development. It's indicative that the first movement that signaled the current revival of Latin American filmmaking, which we're still enjoying, the new Argentine cinema that emerged in the mid-90s, was from the very start largely and then completely digital. Digital equipment made it possible once again for just about anyone to become a filmmaker. To conclude, just let me go over some of the most important developments in terms of film production in the major producers in recent years. In Argentina, the rise of this new, new Argentine cinema in the mid-90s coincided with the Menem regime and the presidency at Inca, the state film agency, of Julio Maharris, a folklorist who was implacably hostile to any film that didn't offer a glowing portrait of his country. Because of that, most of the independents preferred to go without any state support, pooling their resources and self-financing their films. The great success of Adrian Caetano and Bruno Stagnaro's Pizza, Beer and Smokes, Pizza Birafaso, in 1998 helped crystallize a youth market for this new cinema, which was increasingly reached through small festivals or screenings at irregular venues such as universities. Later Argentine governments proved more accommodating to the new filmmakers, yet the continuing economic crisis made levels of support very small. An important new factor for Argentine cinema, especially, but Latin American cinema in general, was the emergence of international co-production and co-financing. Up until the 1990s, a handful at best of Argentine films received international co-production. By 2000, 70% of all Argentine films were co-productions with Spain. France, Germany, Holland, and even Japan all became active in Latin American film production, along with NGOs such as the Hubert Balls Fund or the Monte Cinema Verita Fund. There was even a certain amount of intra-Latin American co-production, with Argentina serving as a source of funding for Uruguayan and Bolivian productions, or Mexico for Central American films. Perhaps the biggest problem facing filmmakers is the lack of screens. In 1970, Argentina had over 1,500 working film screens, but by 1995, that number had been reduced to only 475. Although there has been a significant number uh, increase in screens in recent years, the vast majority of these are mall-type cinemas, controlled by one or two major chains which show Hollywood product almost exclusively. Add to this an impressive, if problematic, growth in, growth in production. From 2000 to 2009, Argentina averaged 81 films per year, far more films that far more films than so, so many films that many of them never get released. One bright bit of news, the recent Argentine film Wild Tales, Relatos Salvajes, is the most popular film in Argentine history and has been a huge hit in several other countries as well. And it was produced by the Almodovar brothers, Pedro and Agustin. For Brazil, the recovery has been less interesting artistically, in my opinion, but more successful in terms of establishing effective institutions for film production. Beginning in 1996, the government of Fernando Henrique Cardoso announced its intention to re help revive the film industry. That year, they created a tax incentive law offering tax deductions ranging from 1 to 3 percent for private individuals or corporations that supported Brazilian films, raising the limit to 5 percent in 1999. The government also established a national line of credit for film production, offering 2 percent loans, a fund that reached $160 million by 2000. Also for the first time, the Brazilian cinema, as an industry, was included in the federal development plans for productivity and development, with actual goals for the domestic market share and income for film exports being set, even if not actually often met. Perhaps the biggest recent development, though, for Brazil, excuse me, has been the passing of the 2010 audiovisual law, which requires all Brazilian TV stations 
broadcast cable and satellite to have a certain number of hours each week for Brazilian produced content. This has led to a flood of attempts to create series on the HBO model along the lines of The Wire or Mad Men. In fact, my own department at Columbia has been deeply involved in this effort, running workshops on television writing in Rio, led by members of our faculty and some of our Brazilian alumni. In terms of overall production, Brazil averaged about 65 films a year from 2000 to 2009, although it seems that by 2014, the production of over 100 films a year has again arrived, the highest level since the 1970s. But as in Argentina, the problem is finding cinemas or platforms through which these films can be reduced, released, as probably less than one-third of them actually made it to film theaters in 2014. Finally, to speak of Mexico, by the early 1990s, oops, excuse me, by the early 1990s, most of Mexico's export market, so crucial in its financial equation, had disappeared. The endless repetition of softcore sex comedies, action films, or horror films had finally worn out its welcome, or had been replaced by newly emerging film production in countries such as Colombia, Venezuela, or Peru. Production scaled way back, hardly breaking into double digits in the early 1990s. What did remain, however, was a much more auteur-driven cinema, with the emergence of a new generation of extremely talented young directors such as Alfonso Cuaron, Alejandro Iñárritu, and Guillermo del Toro, filmmakers who moved easily between personal and more commercial projects, Hollywood and Mexico. Their growing success once again uh, focused attention on the Mexican cinema with works such as Cronos, Okay. Cronos, Solo con tu pareja, Amores perros, y tu mama también, garnering worldwide critical acclaim. The election in 2000 of a right-wing pan-government brought about a defunding of the cultural sector, but already a new generation of younger Mexican directors were already switching to digital production and learning to assess international sources of co-financing. The second PAN administration of Felipe Calderón tried to reverse PAN's neglect of the arts when went the other direction by embarking on a number of enormous cultural projects, such as the creation of the new Cineteca Nacional in Mexico City, a 10-screen complex that is devoted to showing at least 50% Mexican production, which has so far proved to be the most successful cinema in all of Mexico. In terms of more direct funding for films, the Mexican government has had conflicts with some of the regulations that came with the NAFTA agreements, such as the forbidding of screen quotas. The recently re-elected PRI announced its intentions to expand government subsidies for films, but thus far has made little difference or impact, with average Mexican production in 2000-2009 being just 42 films a year. This has been just a bare-bones outline of the development in contemporary scene regarding Latin American film production. If I can fill in more details or answer any questions, I'd be pleased to do so. Thank you.